Nigel Whittam, hello. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, I'm well, thanks. I'm um, enjoying lockdown. Aren't we all? Um, <laughs> you are obviously the MP for Nottingham East, but you've you've gone back to care work, and well, there's a lot for us to talk about there. But just first of all, you're, you're allowed outside quite a bit more than the rest of us are at the moment, and I, I wondered what what the outside world is like right now. Oh, it's bliss. It's so nice. It's so nice going outside. I've never been so excited to go for a 6.45am shift before. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's giving you a new, a new joy in a way that it didn't previously. Um, obviously, you, you, were a care, you, you did care work before you became an MP, but at this time, you've decided to go back. Why? Because social care, as you'll know from watching the news or speaking to anyone who receives care or works in care, Social care is already on the rocks. It's really struggling and really stretched as it is. So we're just not prepared for this pandemic. So I'm going back as an act of practical solidarity with my colleagues who are struggling under this increased pressure and also with the older people I used to care for who are at higher risk. I think underlying in what you've said there is is this sort of um, realisation that our, our society or, or more specifically the government has come to, which is that, that carers are not as low skilled as they were previously treated. Exactly. The workers that Pretty Patel described as being low skilled, you know, the shop workers, cleaners, care workers, bin collectors, these are the people who society is relying on they're keeping society afloat and the truth is they always have but now the government is finally realizing that and i just hope that that will be followed up with proper funding proper paying conditions and valuing of the work that low-paid often precarious workers do so there's i mean there's, there's a broader question there about you know the the private sector and the public sector and how we've sort of outsourced these um, public services, you know, for, you know, food supply to supermarkets, cleaning to to, to cleaning companies, etc. But but I'd, I'd like to sort of explore a little bit more with you the um, the relationship there, the, the sort of the status that that you that you you're talking about there that perhaps um, these low skilled workers aren't as valued um, mm. previously. Why do you think that is, and, and what do you think our our society values instead of those people? I think that, why do I think that is? I think it's because the government has decided to pay these people less. So the government's decided to pay care workers and cleaners a low wage. And then because of that, calls them, us, low skilled. Um, and it's it's interesting that the jobs that we were told were, were very important, like um, stockbrokers and bankers are nowhere to be seen delivering care cleaning our hospitals cleaning the streets dropping rounds food deliveries can you um can you explain what what the work involves because I'm, I'm sure that people will respond respond to what you're saying here and say that you know, it's about um, the level of training that's required, the the precision, the nature of the work. Can you just explain, you know, a little bit of what what that work entails, and 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 why actually you think that that the the label of being low skilled is 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 totally misapplied in this instance? I'm an MP, and because I've been out of care work for longer than three months. I've got to retrain to do my job. So I'm ongoing retraining now. My colleagues, Becca and Miriam, have been training me yesterday to use the hoists and things. I'll undergo renewal of training in administering medication, in infectious diseases, protection, personal protection equipment, um, keeping food clean, food hygiene, all sorts of things I'll undergo training in safeguarding of adults. So my job is at the place that I work. It's delivering from lower level care right up until end of life care. So we provide all elements of personal care, administering medication, washing, um, and then even down to the more interpersonal stuff, like a lot of people we see in the day 
will be the only people they see. So we're responsible for making sure that everything's okay, for noticing if there's anything different and if they need more help, like for example, if they need to be admitted to hospital, if they're having a mental health crisis. Could, could you just tell me a little bit more about the personal protective equipment? Because obviously that, that's a massive issue at the moment for frontline NHS staff, A&E doctors, um, the uh, A&E doctors, people in ICUs, you know, the equipment they're using is is essentially not up to WHO, World Health Organization specification. You know, they've got surgical masks rather than snug, tight fitting to form a seal around the face. You know, um, I've seen photos of nurses using wearing bin bags um, to, to, care, to care for their patients. What sort of personal protective equipment has been made available to, to you and, and your place of work when administering care to these people? Well, we're fortunate in the respect that our immediate managers and the managers above them are all care workers themselves. So we've been issued with bags that get boil washed every night and they're full of our personal protective equipment. So in that we've got um, little like elasticated plastic bag type things for our feet. Um, We've got plastic disposable aprons. Obviously we use gloves anyway. We've got sleeves. We have a very, very limited supply of masks if there's an outbreak. So we currently don't have any COVID cases in the retirement village, so we're not using the masks. But of course, because there isn't enough testing, you can never know for sure whether nobody has COVID. Um, And then we've got tab art as well, like aprons, and they get boil washed every day. So obviously, you know, working in a retirement village, you've essentially got... Uh, a cluster of people who are it's essentially a concentration of the at risk group right you know largely over 70 um, how is how is exactly Corona- and many of them have complex health conditions as well that compounds their risk so how has coronavirus first of all affected your providing of care because obviously the government advice is that some of these people should not be coming into contact with anyone for the next 12 weeks Yeah, it's been difficult for people to get used to because we're asking a lot of them, we're asking them to stand two metres apart, not to leave their apartments unless for for exercise. And a lot of them don't understand why they have to do that. There's a little bit of this, we survived the war, coronavirus isn't going to break us. And we're like, yeah, we know, Jim, but please don't stand so close to John because we need to be careful. Um. There are lots of people or quite a few people who have learning disabilities. So for them, it's even more intensely frustrating and unsettling because their whole routine is changing. Everybody is very, very worried. There's a high level of anxiety in the village. So the village is 500 people oh, wow. and about 50 of them we provide care to. And staff themselves are very worried because some of our staff are high risk people and it's difficult for us to, to, to provide people with proper reassurance when we don't have that ourselves from the government. There's a, um, I think that a consequence that we're going to see more and more of as isolation goes on longer and longer. And that's the consequences, the mental health consequences of loneliness and, and, and isolation. I mean, can, can you explain sort of the, how valuable even if it's just you know a meal time in company of other people, how valuable that face to face contact is for some for some of the people you care for, and what the consequences of them not getting that anymore could be. I can't emphasise enough how important it is. I've seen people who have come to the place that I work, um, having lived in their own homes in the community, and. Um, have been very, very isolated. And to see the way that they've come out of their shell, that they've begun to socialise, get involved in activities, even if it's just going down to the village, getting something from the shop and saying hello and good morning to one person, it makes a big difference to people's lives. And we're seeing already how this isolation is impacting them. Because you and I, well, I, I could speak for myself, but I'm assuming, you know, you and I, we can we can stay in touch. We've got Skype as we're speaking now. There's house party. There's all the various different digital forms of communication that can allow us to see our friends and family face to face. And obviously a lot of these people don't have a smartphone, let alone if they had one, they wouldn't know how to use it. 
Yeah, House Party hasn't quite caught on at Lark Hill yet. <laughs> What a surprise! Um, but but uh, uh, on a serious note, though, you know, you're you're talking about taking someone whose social interaction may be the most valuable part of their day to day experience, and that all of a sudden is being reduced to phone calls, right? That that can have a serious impact, can't it? Yeah, yeah, it really can, and especially if um, if their relatives are themselves key workers, then they have less um, less interaction with them. The Retirement village is on lockdown and has been for over a week now. So that's difficult for them not to be able to see their loved ones and difficult for their loved ones not to be able to see them because some of them are are very, very unwell people who are nearing end of life. So we've got one man who I used to care for when I was back working there and he unfortunately died. Um... He wasn't particularly old. It was a real shock for all of us. It's his funeral today and none of us can go. And that's that's really hard because so, he was he was such a big part of everybody's lives. So, so can you explain the um the, the stipulation? I'm so sorry to hear that. Can you can you explain what, what is it carers can't go, family can't go? What what's the what's the the guidance there? The government guidance is that you can go to funerals if it's somebody in your close family. Um, And if there isn't a family member at the funeral, then um, a friend can go. But this gentleman has a brother, which is is good, but we we can't go. So, I mean... It's it's, it's a surreal surreal thing to think that there there are people who... Are potentially going to have funerals with one person in attendance, you know. If, if yeah, that... and they they don't deserve that. No, absolutely not. Um, you mentioned that some of your um, some of your colleagues were worried, and I wanted to know um, how you're feeling because, you know, by 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 doing this, you're obviously exposing yourself to coming into contact with more people than the rest of us are. You know. I've been working from home for two weeks now. All I, all, the only people I come into contact with are when I do a food shop. That's it. But obviously, you are you're out there. You're dealing with people. You're caring for them, and and so therefore, you're increasing your exposure. Your exposure to risk. I wonder, are, are you worried? Are, are you scared about about going back out and providing care for people? I am worried about it because because we don't have mass testing and contact tracing. So in the UK, we're just about testing 10,000 people a day, so 70,000 people a week. In Germany, they're testing 500,000. That's the scale that we need to be testing at. Um, The fact that we're not means that we can be unwittingly passing on this virus and contracting it. I'm worried personally because my mum is very high risk. We live together, so she's in the group of people that can't even go outside, really. Um, So I'm, I'm being very careful undressing when I come into the house and wiping down all the surfaces with alcohol. Um, but if we had testing, that would that would mean that all of us could keep ourselves and our loved ones safer. Now, she's a key worker who is able to work from home, so at least she doesn't have to go out. But it's still a huge worry. Yeah, obviously, I don't want to make this too close to home, but we've heard that the first frontline worker has been killed by... The virus and an eye, nose, and, and throat consultant, and it's you know I should say the science on this isn't immediately clear, but there is some thinking that by working in hospitals and places where there is a high um, high density of the virus, by exposing yourself to a higher viral load, your own um, experience can then be much more severe, and you can have a mu- and you can have a much more significant um, illness than if you had got it passingly, you know, let's say on public transport or or, or something like that. I mean. How concerned are you? Not just not just for your own health, but also you know for the health of for the health of our NHS staff, for the people who are who are leading the fight against this virus. I'm really gravely concerned about the health of NHS and social care staff. We just we need mass testing, and there's there's a scale of priority, and it starts with people in intensive care, and then with people who have pneumonia and are suspected of having coronavirus. And then a bit further down the list is NHS staff, social care staff, prison staff. 
we need to be much further down that list. We need to be able to provide testing for every single member of frontline staff and then to be doing contact tracing. And we're just nowhere near. And meanwhile, the virus is spreading rapidly. I know, obviously, um, you know, this is, we're, we're in a state of emergency and I don't think anyone would want to um, unnecessarily sort of put the politically um, criticise or punish the government. But, you know, everyone acknowledges that these are unprecedented times and people are doing what they can. But it feels like there has been a bit of a, um, there was a, a window perhaps where protective equipment orders could have been put in, test test kits could have been ordered during February when essentially we knew that this virus was, was in China, that it was lethal and it had the potential to be a pandemic. And it, and it feels like the government response has, has been slow. Would you agree with that? It has been slow. And we're trailing behind other countries that have successfully contained the virus, but not far behind Italy that has an extremely high mortality rate. And that's because the government hasn't acted fast enough or gone far enough. And still, not everybody is able to stay at home because people don't have access to statutory sick pay statutory sick pay itself is not high enough um people are self-employed and don't that self-employment scheme isn't kicking in until june so in the meantime what are they supposed to do there are millions of people who aren't able to self-isolate and everyone needs to stay at home in order to contain the spread of this virus so when's the government gonna act do you do you think the order in which um sort of the government measures came out speak to their priorities in a sort of way i know that there's also the argument that it's it's easier for example to introduce provision for homeowners and people who are salaried and and paid via paye schemes um and that it may, it's taken longer for them to provide you know some kind of provision for people who live in privately rented accommodation uh for the self-employed i know there are still gaps but do, do, do you think that the fact that sort of homeowners and the salaried were taken care of first, do you think that speaks to anything particularly about this government? Or, or do you think it is just a case of um, that, you know, easier, easy, easier to implement measures came first? I don't think that the government can solely rely on the excuse that those measures are easier to implement. It could, you know, the government does have the choice to roll out protection for everybody um, including zero hours contract workers renters um, for example through an emergency universal basic income that would be quicker than the delays in the universal credit system um, what I'm particularly concerned about in my constituency is construction works ongoing I think that government guidance has been deliberately ambiguous so as to leave room for profit making. So construction workers are still going out, working in unsafe conditions because the government hasn't mandated building sites to shut down, only advised that they do. Yeah, some workers are finding themselves in this rather unfortunate position, aren't they, of being um, pressured to come into work by their employers, um, being exploited by their employers because, you know, if, 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 if it's non-essential, then really they have no business being anywhere near a building site or a warehouse or a shop floor, do they? Yeah, and as much as we might love or not love to have a massive coster on the high street and a block of luxury flats, people's health comes first. I think that's true, Nadia. Um, thank you for what you're doing uh, and, and help, helping people out. Um, you know, not, not a lot of people would do that. So thank you and all the best. Take care. Take care. Bye.